John chapter 2 through 3. That's what we're discussing today. Um, I'll be honest, I was a little sad when I opened up the quarterly to see that they just scratched chapter 2. And they're just like, here's a brief summary of chapter 2 and, and move on. And I'm like, oh, but chapter 2 is so good. So we're going to touch on chapter 2 whether they like it or not. Uh, because I like chapter two, and I feel like there's a lot of richness in there. Um, I find that uh, God's word is full of richness, and there's really, as I've studied God's word through my life and and learned, I find that there's really nothing that is uh, weak sauce, if you will, uh, in Scripture. Even when you're going through genealogies, you can find something rich within the genealogies, and uh, it, it's quite amazing how alive God's word really is um one thing there's a, a there's a he's passed away but there's there's a, a doctor of, of uh, biblical studies that uh likes to use a certain verse and I'm going to steal his little his little thing and I'm going to have you guys write this down if you guys are taking notes uh Acts 17 11 and that verse is basically saying don't trust anything that I'm saying uh determine it for yourself that it's true uh, so it, it's, it's, it's wise to not take anyone's word for it, but to dig into it and determine for yourself that uh, what is being taught, uh, especially from Scripture, is tr- true and, and, and is uh, inherently true from God's word. Um, so that being said, we'll dig into it. I'll probably do all the reading just so it's recorded on this gadget. Um, yeah, because they can't hear you guys reading. <laughs> so I'm get, I get to do a lot of reading. This is, yeah, it's good. I, I struggle with reading, so if you, if I stumble, bear with me. Um, but I wrote all the different sections that we'll be pausing at up on the board, so you guys can see it. Um, and I'll probably announce it as well for the sake of the tape. Or I guess it's not a tape. Wow, that kind of dates me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> this device. <laughs> um, So we're going to start with uh, John 2, 1 through 4. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Yeah, so Mary's telling him something that really has nothing to do with him, and he states that too. Like, what does that have to do with me? And expects him to do something. Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing I learned that I guess I've never really paid much attention to and never really caught before is uh, Jesus' mother's name is never married, never mentioned as Mary in the book of John. Not once. Even at the cross, it's referred to as uh, Jesus' mother is standing there. <laughs> that, that's who she's referred to as, is Jesus' mother. Uh, another thing that I hadn't really noticed is that uh, John is never mentioned in the book of John. Uh, just another interesting thing. Uh, it may be a, a, a thing where uh, maybe he's just doesn't want him to have the spotlight in any way, shape, or form, doesn't want that temptation to occur. I don't know. Um, but I found those two things kind of interesting. Uh, another thing that always has caught my attention, even as he, uh, when I was way young, is Jesus calling his mother a woman. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, everyone. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'd get the back of either my mom's hand or my dad's hand for that one. Um, but I, honestly, I don't think Jesus is being disrespectful because I don't find Jesus to be a disrespectful person. But I do think that there's an, an interesting thing that's happening here. Um, because in, in Genesis, again, chapter 3, I'll open up again, 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So I think this is very interesting that Jesus is calling her the woman, and 
and also, well, it doesn't say the woman, but says woman, uh, but also refers to her as, as a woman uh, another time. So it's, it's interesting because she is the woman <laughs> whose seed is, is uh, prophes- prophesied, and he is referring to her as woman, titling her as woman. Um, thought that was interesting. Again, maybe nothing, but... Um, now we're going to go into John 2, 5 through 12. His mother said to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish, Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, I hope they did since they drew it, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, uh, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brother, uh, brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Yeah, Jesus doesn't have any trouble breaking the laws of physics. Yeah. He's he's okay with that. Yeah, when you write the yeah, laws of physics, you you could do what you want with them, right? Yeah. Things that that caught my attention. One, Jesus's mother said something that applies, I think, to everybody. It's something that everyone can take to heart. It says, uh, "Do what he says." <laughs> Like it, she didn't reprimand him for calling him woman or or, or giving him a stern response, um, and he, even though he, he stated it wasn't his time, was respectful and honored his mother's wishes. But at the same time, her response was do whatever he says, and the servants do exactly what he says, no matter how silly it is. They that he did it, you know, and that's something that we as believers can definitely take to heart. Is you know we're told to do what he says and in sometimes what we know he is telling us to do seems a little silly or uncomfortable or you know not quite not quite right in our own eyes but he's got a purpose for it and he always comes through uh, again i feel like uh, one of the things he is doing is he's identifying mary as the woman mentioned in Genesis three fifteen, the woman who has the seed that will crush the head. Uh, so, I think I think he's identifying her. Really, is my thought. Um, but also, I don't I don't consider culturally in the U.S. when we say woman, it, it is disrespectful, you know, which is weird because if they are a woman. <laughs> <laughs> why would it be considered disrespectful? It, it's an interesting thing, and it, it may have to do with just our culture and our history uh, and, and the different uh, struggles that we've had. could be deeper than what is being seen here or that we're catching. That's that's the thing that, that's great about Scripture is the fact that there's a lot to wrestle with. And for me, <clears throat> reading Scripture, I'm always looking for symbolisms because I find them everywhere. And I'm like, what does this represent? And I find a lot in this portion. Um, for instance, in verse 6, now there were six stone water pots. What sticks out to me is that six. What's significant about six? What is six in the Bible? It's the number of man. Six is the number of man. Uh, and I find that very interesting because we got six stone water pots, the number of man. And um, we've also been referred to as earthenware. So it's kind of interesting that you got these six water pots. And I, so I see these six water pots representing man. And uh, 
Jesus says to fill him up with water. He's telling his servants, hey, you got a job. Fill these up with water. And then he presents the water to the head waiter. And the waiter identifies it as wine. And another interesting thing is wine representing God's blood in Scripture. The fact, what, what the waiter says. It's like, oh, everybody else does the good wine first and saves the poor wine for later, but you save the good wine for last. And so in my head at home, I was I was battling through this with, with myself, and I'm like, I'll bet they did serve the good wine first. And then it got real bad, and then really good stuff came out. And I see that as, you know, man had a relationship with God that was unparalleled to anything at the beginning. They had the good wine. And then it became real bitter because of man. <laughs> and and it, it became poor wine. But then Christ came and made really good wine. And at the very end, we're going to taste that really excellent wine, you know. So anyhow, there's, there's a lot of richness in there. Uh, the fact that he saved that and the, the fact that he was respectful, the... You know, the fact that he's performing a miracle and wine of all things is what's being used. Um, and I mean, he's not in charge of this wedding. He was a guest at the wedding. Um, <laughs> so it, it's interesting. It's very interesting. And then they, they peaced out him, his mom, his brothers, his disciples. They left town which uh, is exactly what's going to happen at the very end. He's, he's taking his family with him and leaving, peacing out. All right, so now we're going to do a do 2, 13 through 25 of John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated at their tables. And he made a cord, uh, sorry, a, a score of cord, <clears throat> and drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took Forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing but jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men and because he did not need any one to testify concerning man for he himself knew what was in man well and i think another interesting thing is he's in town for the passover and that's around the time he died as well so it's kind of interesting that he's making this statement of his death uh, on the anniversary of his death <laughs> it's kind of interesting i mean uh, perhaps that was deliberate um but yeah the fact that uh he's he's making the claim you can kill me and i'll come back in three days and only i can do that because uh, i'm god you know that's a a very bold statement but they didn't catch it the disciples didn't even catch it and they didn't question it either which is interesting because the disciples always do they're like, what did you mean by that? Like, all the time. And he's like, you guys, how long do I have to deal with you? Come on. That, that's, it's interesting, because they never, they never asked about it. 
but they remembered it when it actually occurred. And that's very fascinating. Uh, I think the fact that he has this zeal, um, that he, he sits down and makes this whip. Like, uh, how long does it take to make a whip? You know, he sits down and makes this thing and then goes in for it. Like, this is not something that was like on a fly. He walked in and then all of a sudden started whipping. I'm like, you know, he identified there was a problem. He was going and prepared for it. And I mean, that's that's a zeal. I mean, you have time that entire time to be like, this is a bad idea. But no, this was a good idea. This was a holy idea. This was God making a a, a move. Uh And the fact that he refers to it as my father's house, I think is, is fantastic because it seems that the people forgot. They forgot what this place represented. And here's a reminder for you. This is my father's house and here's my father's rod. Here we come. <laughs> and, st- and he starts making a mess when you really think about it. He's overturning tables, dumping things on the ground. He's making a mess. He's, he's making a point. Um, and uh, it's it's pretty interesting because this is supposed to be a place of worship. It's not uncommon in their culture to have people doing those things to make it possible for you to be able to sacrifice. Because if you're traveling from far away, you might not be able to bring all those things with you. Um, so it, it's also kind of a convenience. <laughs> but um, if I remember right, and take this with a grain of salt, the place in which they are conducting this is in the place for the Gentiles to worship. And so it's interrupting um, a place of worship for the Gentiles because the Gentiles had one part that they could go and worship, but then there's designated areas for the Jewish people. And, and they're taking over an area that is meant for the Gentiles to be able to worship the Lord. And... He's like, no, this is not what this area is meant for. You want to do this? You you can go ahead and do this outside. That's fine. Don't do it in here. I think I think there's an important thing to note um, is that the temple is is referred to as God's house, and when Christ died, our bodies are His temple, and so I hope you're not having bazaars in your body, <laughs> but the church building. The church building is just a it's just a building. It's designated location for us to come and worship, yes, uh, and to gather because we're not supposed to forsake our gathering as believers. The church itself is the body. We can have a church without a building. Um, but our our bodies are the temple of the living God. He sent his spirit to dwell in us. Um, and so it's it's a little different. The the location of, of his dwelling has moved because with the Israelites, uh, his dwelling, as they identified it, was always in one place. First, it was in the tabernacle that moved around, with, you know, that guided them through the wilderness, and they'd set up the tabernacle, and he'd dwell in the tabernacle, and then eventually they built the temple. David designed it. Solomon built it, and that was considered God's dwelling place, right? And so there was a place of worship. Uh, But there was only one, only one temple. Um, That temple has since been destroyed. Anyhow, he goes in, he goes in aggressive. He goes in hot. And he does something that he then gives a a prophecy of himself. He goes and cleanses this temple. And then they say, well, what gives you the right to cleanse? Which is interesting because he's also later on tells a man, your sins are your sins are forgiven you, and they get real upset at him, and they're like, "Who gives you the right?" And again, he's you know, it's like, "Come on, you guys haven't figured this out yet." But he's like, "What? Tell me what's easier." And this is something that anyone could agree with: is it easier to tell someone your sins are forgiven, or is it easier to heal them of something that uh, has not ever been healed before? Right? Uh, is it easier to take a person who's lame since birth and tell him, "You know, get up and walk and heal him"? Which one's easier? Anyone could say, well, telling someone they're forgiven is way easier. All right, get up and walk. Go away. <laughs> and they get up and walk. It's like, all right, is that is that enough evidence for you? <laughs> like, is that, does that do it? Yeah. So he he goes in and he cleanses the temple, which is which is great because that's exactly what he does to believers. 
He goes in and he cleanses them. That is what they do. And what does it take to cleanse them? It takes the destruction of his temple and it being raised back up in three days. So, uh, again, a symbolism that can be identified. All right, we're getting into chapter three now. Yeah, moving right along. One through eight. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows, there is, uh, the wind blows, there is wishes, and you, you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's a lot going on in here. First thing we see, we see a Pharisee, which, I mean, growing up as a Christian becomes notoriously the bad guy. <laughs> the Pharisees and Sadducees and uh, uh, the scribes, these guys are typically the bad guys, but he's coming to them. He's also a, a ruler of the Jews. Perhaps he was uh, a Sanhedrin, uh, a member of the board. Uh, and so he's got authority, and uh, he's he's identified later as a, as a, a teacher as well, and we'll get there. But uh, he's coming to him, and he's he's calling him rabbi, uh, which is a really respectful term. So he's not denying Jesus the title of rabbi, and I think that's kind of important um, because he's not being disrespectful. He's actually being very respectful, coming to him and referring to him as the title of rabbi. Um, and then he makes a statement. Uh, he says, We know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's not identifying that he is God, He's identifying that God is with him, and he's identifying that he is a teacher, and that he's a, a teacher that is fully supported by God. So he's identifying these things. So naturally, when you have an opportunity to talk to someone that you know has God's full support, you're going to ask the questions that you are very much pondering. <laughs> The things that you struggle with most about Scripture and the debates that are going on around you. Uh, but he didn't even ask a question. But Jesus starts answering the question anyways. Because Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, which that's, it's like, pay attention. What I'm about to tell you is very important because he said it twice. You know, when they say it twice, it means, hey, pay attention. This is truly, truly. Um, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot be, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that's, um, that's a puzzling statement. And uh, I've heard it said that Nicodemus's following question uh, was kind of snarky. They say this is kind of a snarky response. In, and uh, I have a hard time with that because I feel like he's being respectful. He's got a question. I think Jesus' statement confused him. Uh, I honestly think it confused him because like, well, that was a really weird statement. Jesus, what do you mean by that? Um Maybe he was being snarky, but but I honestly feel like if it were me and someone's like, oh, you have to be born again, and we had never heard the term born again, we'd be like, what? 
<laughs> that's not a. So you're saying when my wife gives birth, do I shove that baby back in so it could be born, born twice? What, what? What is this? It's kind of a confusing statement. Why does it say it sounds like nonsense? Yeah, it, it, I'd say it sounds like nonsense. But uh, it is the tradition of Jewish education to debate. Yes. And to ask questions. Yes. And it's not considered disrespectful. Right. This is, actually, this is his job. Yeah. As a Pharisee, this is his job. To, to take prophets and verify that they are actually prophets because they're identified. God is with you. He, you couldn't do these things if he wasn't. We have to test you now. Identify, are you truly from God? Are you really, are you pulling our leg? So he has to. He has to debate it. And so he's got to ask these questions, but at the same time, this is a really weird statement. And I think that Jesus' statement really did take him back. He, I think it did. I think he's like, whoa, where'd that come from? <laughs> Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Probably referring to himself. Well, this is a problem if this is true because I'm old. I can't be born a second time. Maybe if I were an infant still, maybe. <laughs> Not an option now. When he's old. He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again, can he? It's almost like, how is it possible? Tell me tell me the possibilities. And Jesus answers, and again, pay attention, truly, truly, right? I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And a lot of denominations try to take this part and say that baptism is what leads to salvation, and that's not what this is saying. And I think that's very important to note. This is not a, you have to be baptized and believe to be saved. It's not a twofer here. Uh, and he, he follows this up with what it is he's meaning by this water and spirit by saying that which is born of flesh is flesh, which we are mostly water. Let's just face it, we're, we're mostly water. <laughs> so flesh is flesh and that uh, that which is born of spirit is spirit so he's addressing what this is to be born of water and of spirit you got to be born clearly you got to be born right but to be born again is the spirit you got to be born again in spirit and then jesus continues do not be amazed that i said to you you must be born again the wind blows where it, uh, I get lost in this part every time. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's like he, he's telling him, like you, you can't identify where the Spirit's coming either. You know, you can't, uh, you, can, you can't identify where the wind's coming and where it's going. You can't identify where the Spirit's coming and where it's going. You guys think that you're the only ones, but really it's going to be going to the Gentiles as well. This is, I'm here to, uh, to bless the world. You know, through, through uh, Abraham's seed, the world will be blessed. Um, and, and it's this interesting thing. It's like you can't predict it. <laughs> you can't predict this. Nicodemus said to him, how can this, these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, okay, so basically, how can it be that you're born of spirit? How is that possible? Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Hey, you should know better. You study this. You quiz people on it. You push it. You teach it. <laughs> you should know this. And there's the definite article. You are the teacher you are the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things. It's like, this is your job. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one can ascend, can ascend no one has ascended into heaven but he who has ascended from heaven the son of man as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness uh, even so must the son of man be lifted up and i've, I've kind of passed the marker over what we're talking about but that's okay <laughs> uh, so what so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life um 
So for the tape's sake, we've made it all the way through 15 now, verse 15 of chapter 3. Uh, Nicodemus is officially puzzled, and Jesus is a little frustrated and points out that he, what he knows, what he understands, it's not enough. It's not enough. He's, he's missing information. He's lacking information. His traditions have gotten in his way. And uh, he's calling him out on it. I, I think one thing we can kind of fly back in the chapter just a little bit. Um, he comes to him in the night. And a lot of people take this as, you know, he's coming to him secretly. He doesn't want people knowing that he's coming. Um, and, and maybe that's the case. But honestly, I don't think so. Because he's, he's the teacher. He's a leader. He, he is probably on the Sanhedrin. He's a man who is well-respected. Uh, if anything, uh, this is something where people would be more curious. What is he doing? What is he finding out? Not so much of, look at him going into this. Jesus hasn't gotten that reputation quite yet. He, I mean, he's early on in his ministry. Um, instead, I would suggest that what he's doing, he's, he's coming at a time where Jesus is, is uh, not quite as occupied, where he's got Jesus' full attention. It's cool uh, of night. It's not too hot. Uh, he's not too surrounded by people. Um, he has an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation where he can get his answers without a bunch of interruptions. Because as a, uh, a member of the Sanhedrin, as a Pharisee, he's probably a busy guy too. He's probably got a lot going on. And then you also have Jesus who is quite surrounded by people who are fascinated by what he's doing and what he's saying. So this is kind of his opportunity to probe Jesus. Uh, and, he, and he's getting some honest answers. And he's not really being defensive, which is kind of interesting because uh, throughout when we're reading the New Testament, um, that is something that the Pharisees are doing. They're being pretty defensive and offensive. Uh, but in this case, he's just, he's curious, right? You can't witness something unless you've actually seen it, right? You can't testify of something unless you actually experienced it, seen it, you know it. You, you, I mean, they don't call a witness to a stand if they uh, didn't see it, they didn't hear it. They didn't witness it. They don't call him, right? And he's like, we're, ta we're talking about things we've seen. That's what we do, right? We talk about things that we've seen. We talk about things that we know. And uh, he's confused. He's like, I'm, I'm talking to you about things you have seen, things that you do know, things that you understand, things that are earthly. I'm talking about these things, and you're not getting it. So if I'm going to talk to you about something spiritual, which is the reason you came here, Nicodemus, you came here to talk about spiritual things. If I'm supposed to talk to you things about heaven and, and heavenly things, how do you expect to understand those things if you can't understand these simple things that I'm talking to you about? If you're confused by this be born twice thing, how can how can you expect to understand the bigger things? And, and he's kind of calling him out on the carpet. Another thing that he mentions, his... Um, his death again and uh and kind of an explanation but he doesn't straight out say it he just says um as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up and i think an interesting thing here is that uh, jesus later on ends up referring to these scribes and pharisees as uh, vipers broods of vipers a type of serpent and that jesus is also represented as a serpent up on a tree right on a on a pole and I think that's interesting because it's, it's almost like the, the serpent, who is referred to as a crafty and clever character, right? Can We can see it as someone who's a teacher. And Jesus is a teacher. They are teachers, except they are bad, which, like the Israelites, they got bit by very bad snakes. But then there's a serpent that is represented as one who looked to, and you will be healed. And Jesus, this teacher, will be put up on a pole, looked to, and you will be healed, but in a spiritual fashion. So there's some symbolisms that he's revealing here. Guys, um, there's a symbolism to everything that Moses did. That serpent was not meant to be worshipped. That serpent was meant to be a symbol of who Jesus is and what he's going to do. And then the famous, famous, famous verse here, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. 
he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and man loved the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that it is that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been uh, rotten God. So he, he's still talking to Nicodemus here who came to him in the dark, right? And he's like, you, are you afraid of the light? Like you're, you're coming to me, but are you, are you afraid of the light? I don't know that he came because he was afraid of the dark. I think Jesus is just... He's, is sharing something with him. He's like, there's, there's a darkness in man. There's a darkness in man. And they don't like the idea of the light, which is true. We identify that. We all identify that. Nobody likes to be told that what they're doing is wrong. No one likes it. Uh, even if it's true, even if they know it's true, they don't want to hear it. They want to do what they want to do, but there's a darkness. And those who come to the light, there's, there's no judgment. Why? Because it's all there. It's all revealed. You see it all. But those who are staying in the darkness, they've been judged already. They're, they're in darkness. There's nothing to question there. <coughs> My time is up. Yeah. We still got half the chapter to go through, but I guess that's going to have to. So we didn't get to cover. We didn't get to cover 322 through the end of chapter 3, so for, uh, verse 36. But um, I'd encourage you to go through it on your own and read it, break it down struggle with it, ruffle, uh, ruffle with it, and wrestle with it, and whatever it is you do with it. <laughs> Find out what it has to say. But uh, that's, that's that. Let's close in prayer.